Thank you, Barbara. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. I'm a member of this group. Tonight, we're starting chapter two, There is a Solution. It's an incredibly good chapter. It serves a couple of purposes. In the beginning, when they were writing the book, this chapter and Bill's story were put together as a pamphlet and distributed around to different churches and businesses and so forth so that they could take a look at the book and see if they were interested in it, get the word out that there was going to be a book, and maybe get investors to help them publish the book because they were very low on money in the beginning. It was quite a, you know, quite a bit of work. Also, this chapter is an odd chapter because it's an introduction to the next two chapters. It's an introduction to more about alcoholism. The first part of this will tell us more about alcoholism and then lead us into the third chapter. And then the second part of this chapter is about the solution. So it leads us into we agnostics. So it's a good setup for the next two chapters that come and to give you a little bit of an introduction towards them and a little more information about our disease and how we get over our disease. So it's going to talk about two very important powers in our recovery. One is the power of the fellowship. And that's an amazing power. It's the power of the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous is like no other organization in the world. Doesn't matter what country you're from, doesn't matter anything at all. Whenever you're with other alcoholics in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous, you all get along. You're all friendly. You all know each other. You know, you feel close to a person that's in an AA room, no matter where you are. So the fellowship is a big power. Then the second power that it talks about is the vital spiritual experience sufficient to produce a recovery for from alcoholism. Those are two separate powers and they're two incredibly important powers that have to work together to get us sober and help us stay sober and help us get other alcoholics sober. So it's very interesting. So we'll start off with page 17, top of the page. There is a solution. We have Alcoholics Anonymous know thousands of men and women who were once just as hopeless as Bill. Nearly all have recovered. They have solved the drink problem. So it says they've all recovered. And you hear around the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous this whole debate forever and ever about are you recovered? Are you recovering? You're never recovered. You're still reco recovered. means that you have solved the drink problem, recovered from a helpless and hopeless state of mind and body. And you do that by working the program of action laid out in this book that gets you over the mental obsession, and the physical craving of alcohol. So if you've done your 12 steps, and you've had your spiritual awakening, you are recovered. The trick is you have to keep on learning more stuff. There's more stuff to learn. It doesn't end with being recovered. It doesn't end when you finish your 12 steps because the next thing you're supposed to do is take someone else through the steps. Therefore, you're doing the steps all over again. You're reading every step. You, you read with your sponsees. So you work the same steps over and over and over and over again. You always try to improve. There's always room for improvement in your program. And so it's a lifetime affair. And there's tasks that we have to do in our recovery that are tasks that we have to do every day. We have to repeat those things. We have to keep doing the same thing every day to help us stay sober and help other alcoholics achieve sobriety. So it doesn't end with being recovered. It goes on to say, we are average Americans. We should say they're average citizens because now AA is in well over 
150 countries. I don't know the last count. I remember the last count of being 154 countries around the world. There may have may be more by now. So it's not just an American issue now. This book isn't just for Americans. It's for everybody globally. All sections of this country and many of its occupations are represented, as well as many political, economic, social, and religious backgrounds. We are people who normally would not mix, but there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, an understanding, which is indescribably wonderful. So that's a description of our fellowship. That's what our fellowship is. That's a very powerful thing. Now, Bill's going to describe it even more. And as good teachers do, as a lot of great teachers do, if they want to teach us something, if you want to teach a shepherd something that he's got to learn about, the easiest thing is to relate a story about sheep. Start talking his language. Talk about sheep. He'll understand you. And then bring out your point. If the next guy you talk to is a fisherman, tell him a story about fish. Talk to him about fish, and he understands. And that's what our fellowship is about. It, Bill here does the same thing as any great teacher would do. He tells us a story we may understand and can relate to, and then compares it to what we're going through. So he says, but there exists among us a fellowship, a friendliness, an understanding, which is in indescribably wonderful we are like the passengers of a great liner the moment after rescue from a shipwreck when camaraderie joyousness and democracy pervade the vessel from steerage to cap captain's table on a ship the old days when before airplanes flew across the oceans all the time traveled from one continent to another on a, on a steamship and there was steerage for the real poor people, the people who couldn't afford any good accommodations. They could pay a little bit of money, but they were deep down in the bowels of the ship, down layers, decks and decks and decks down in the boat. It didn't have great ventilation. It was dirty. You didn't have much service down there. And if you paid a little bit more money, it got, you know, class four, fourth class. That's a little bit higher up in the boat and a little bit better service. And then third class and second class, every class got you higher up in the boat towards the fresh air. And each level got you better service. And then if you really had the money, you could have first class. First class was the nicest staterooms, very good food, fresh air all the time. And on top of that, there's even another group that were so elite and had so much money and had so much prestige that they used to get to sit at the captain's table. The captain's table was the cat's meow. It was the best food. It was the best service. Everything was great at the captain's table. But the way the ship was rolled, you know, lined up, the people that are sitting at the captain's table would never even see anybody from steerage. They wouldn't even cross paths the whole time. So they, you know, they had to, you know, it was hard to do. So the thing about it was that boat, the Titanic, hit an iceberg and sank. Well, at that moment of its sinking, there was a man in a tuxedo and a man from steerage in his overalls standing on the rail of the ship and the boat was sinking they had nothing to do with each other they had never seen each other before but they had to jump overboard and when their butt hit that cold water they had something in common otherwise they did not have anything in common but when they hit that water how are they going to save themselves so they clung to each other like it meant their life because it did and they were together and, you know, nobody asked how much money do you have or no prestige involved. It was, I'm helping you save your life. And they stayed together. And when they were rescued, they hugged, everything was great. But after that, they really didn't have anything in common and they drifted apart. Different is AA. AA 
is that never ceases to happen. It says, unlike feelings of the ship's passengers, however, our joy in escape from disaster does not subside as we go our individual ways. The feeling of having shared in a common peril is one element in the powerful cement that binds us together. But that in itself would never have held us together as we are now joined. So the fellowship is great and the fellowship holds us together. We have a common peril. Our common peril is the first drink. And we have a common solution that holds us together too. If we don't want to have that first drink, this fellowship can help you with that. And that's the fellowship. And that is very powerful. But that in and of itself, cannot get you sober and it cannot keep you sober so it goes on to say the tremendous fact for everyone of us is that we have discovered a common solution we have a way out on which we can absolutely agree and upon which we can join in brotherly and harmonious action this is the great news this book carries to those who suffer from alcoholism. So the fellowship is great, but you won't get sober unless you read this book. The message is in the book. And you can go to all the meetings you want to. You can listen to what people say, but you will never hear the whole book in an AA meeting. You got to pick it up and read it. And I suggest that anyone that's trying to read a big book off one of them apps of some web page, get a damn book. It's not expensive. Get a book, hold it in your hand. It feels real because the solution is real. You can't take notes on a website or on your telephone. Get a book, write in the margins, put down the stuff that's important to you. Mark the pages, turn the corners down and have that book with you all the time. You come to an AA meeting, have your book within reach. And all meetings should be teaching you stuff from that book. It says, an illness of this sort, and we have come to believe it is an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt. So... Again, this is how Bill tells a little story that we understand and then tells us what he's really trying to say. So we understand that if someone is sick with cancer, we feel bad, we'll do anything to help them, but nobody's mad at you. You don't disappoint anyone just because you got cancer. Everybody loves you and everybody tries to help. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it, there goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. It engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, and sad wives and parents. Anyone can increase the list. So alcoholism is not a victimless disease. Everyone around the alcoholic heals the alcoholism. We try not to believe it as alcoholics. We try to believe we're not an alcoholic. But believe me, our family knows, our boss knows, our friends know. Everybody knows. We're usually in the last months to really find out. And all those people are suffering every day as we suffer with alcoholism. But We're drunk. They're not. So we have our escape. We drink into oblivion. They're not in oblivion. They're in life suffering with us. And that has to be fixed. So we hope this volume, meaning this book, we hope this volume will inform and comfort those who are or who may be affected. There are many. Now, people that are affected by alcoholism are not necessarily the alcoholics, as we just read. Family, friends, bosses, people in our community, neighbors, 
are affected by our alcoholism. This book may even help them. Highly competent psychiatrists who have dealt with us have found it sometimes impossible to persuade an alcoholic to discuss his situation without reserve. He lied to the doctors. Strangely enough, wives, parents, and intimate friends usually find us even more unapproachable than do psychiatrists than the doctor. So we don't we just we don't want to talk about it. We just want to drink. Leave us alone, let us drink. And it it, it really causes a lot of turmoil and a lot of lies. And then here's a key. This is a paragraph written in italics. When something's written in the big book in italics, it is very important. So it says, but the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution, who is properly armed with facts about himself, can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic within a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. So while doctors fail, psychiatrists fail, family members fail, no, all the people in the neighborhood fail, another alcoholic can help you. And it takes another alcoholic. And notice it takes in a few hours. So it's not a 15-minute conversation. Nothing may happen in the first conversation. Nothing may happen in the second conversation. It takes time. It takes persistent work but it takes time sometimes to get somebody's real confidence we have to work at it a little bit that the man who is making the approach has had the same difficulty that he obviously knows what he is talking about that his whole deportment shouts at the new prospect that he is a man with with a real answer that he has no attitude of holier than thou nothing whatever except the sincere desire to be helpful, that there are no fees to pay, no axes to grind, no people to please, no lectures to be endured. These are the conditions we have found most effective. After such an approach, many take up their beds and walk again. So we can really convince a guy, and listen, it's hard. There's not a lot of people out there in the world that really care whether you get sober or not. What they want you to do is take your alcoholism alcoholism somewhere else and don't bother me with it. And they can't understand you. You know, they don't know why you're drinking. They're not able to help. So they feel useless. But another alcoholic can fix that. And if another alcoholic gets in touch with an alcoholic, a new prospect, and he gets sober, he picks up his bed, he walks again. None of us makes a sole vocation of this work, nor do we think its effectiveness would be increased if we did. We feel that elimination of our drinking is but a beginning. A much more important demonstration of our principles lies before us in our respective homes, occupations, and affairs. Getting rid of drinking is but the first blessing you get. But then there's more. And you have to go after working our principles. And our principles are the 12 steps. The set of principles. So we're working our steps and practicing those principles in everything we do every day. At work, at home, and at fun. We work our steps every day. And that helps the uh, other alcoholic understand us better. All of us spend much of our spare time in the sort of effort which we are going to describe. A few are fortunate enough to be so situated that they can give nearly all of their time to the work. If if we keep on the way we are going, there is little doubt that much good will result, but the surface of the problem would hardly be scratched. Those of us who live in large cities are overcome by the reflection that close by, hundreds are dropping into oblivion every day. 
many could recover if they had the opportunity we have enjoyed. How then shall we present that which has been so freely given us? And that's what we're going to talk about in this book as we go further through this book. We're going to learn how to get these principles in our lives, practice them ourselves, be able to demonstrate that to others, and then help them to receive the same blessings and benefits we have from the program of action described in this book. We have concluded to publish an anonymous volume setting forth the problem as we see it. We shall bring to task our combined experience and knowledge. This should suggest a useful program for anyone concerned with a drinking problem. So where is the solution? Where is the program? In the book. The program is in the book. Of necessity, there will have to be a discussion of matters medical, psychiatric, social, and religious. We are aware that these matters are, for their very nature, controversial. Nothing would please us so much as to write a book which would contain no basis for contention or argument. We shall do our utmost to achieve that ideal. Most of us sense that real tolerance of other people's shortcomings and viewpoints and a respect for their opinions are attitudes which make us more useful to others. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thoughts of others and how we may help meet their needs. Very important. I mean, the whole point of the book is for us to learn the principles of the program, not for ourselves, but to be able to help another alcoholic who has, as of yet, not had the opportunities we have had. And we get to help them by introducing them to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And the program is in the book. And we get them to come to meetings so they get to use the fellowship. The fellowship is very powerful. But the book has the answers. The book is where the solution is. So we get them into the book. You may already have asked yourself, why is it? that all of us became so very ill from drinking. Doubtless, you are curious to discover how and why, in the face of expert opinion to the contrary, we have recovered from a hopeless condition of mind and body. If you are an alcoholic who wants to get over it, you may already be asking, what do I have to do? Well, it is the purpose of this book to answer such questions specifically, not like a blanket thrown over the problem, specifically, individual answers to individual questions, very detailed. And this program of action is described in this book in a very detailed way. We're going to learn specific answers to specific questions. We shall tell you what we have done before going into a detailed discussion, it may be well to summarize some points as we see them. How many times people have said to us, I can take it alone or I can take it or leave it alone. Why can't he? Why don't you drink like a gentleman or quit? That fellow can't handle his liquor. Why don't you try beer and wine? Lay off the hard stuff. His willpower must be weak. He could stop if he wanted to. She's such a sweet girl. I should think he'd stop for her. The doctor told him that if he ever drank again, it would kill him. But there he is, all lit up again. Now, these are commonplace observations on drinkers, which we hear all the time. Back of them is a world of ignorance and misunderstanding. We see that these expressions refer to people whose reactions are very different from ours. 
So these are people that just haven't given alcoholism enough thought. They don't realize it's a disease. They think it's a bad habit. They think it's something we do on purpose. You know, they think it's easy because they can do it. Oh, well, I can quit. Why can't you? Well, you're not an alcoholic. And now we're going to learn a little bit more about alcoholics. And this is very important to learn this distinction because one thing happens is we have a lot of alcoholics, members of Alcoholics Anonymous that are sitting in rooms all over the world who don't use the book. They don't own a book. They don't read the book. They go to meetings. Meeting makers make it. Go to a meeting. Don't pick up a drink. You know, and this, these words, these slogans put us in a room, but they don't put us in the book. You got to get into the book if you want to learn the answers to, to the program and to your alcoholism, why you actually drink. Most people think it's a physical thing, but it's probably more mind than it is body. And so we have to really, you know, we have to think about that a lot. And we have to recognize who is an alcoholic and who's not an alcoholic. Some people in the rooms are not alcoholics. Some people think they are, but they're not. Some people are in the rooms that are alcoholics, but they don't look for the for the program in the books. I've seen people sitting in rooms for years and say, you know, did you do your steps? Nah, I didn't bother. I, you know, I just, I come to meetings every night. I come to meetings, I don't drink. Well, we see people all the time that are five years, 10 years, 20 years, and they go out. How can you go out after 20 years of sitting in meetings? Well, it's pretty easy if you never open the book. Because the fellowship and the meetings tell you a lot and guide you and tell you to get into the book, like I'm doing tonight. Get into the book. But people don't do that. You don't get that in many meetings. You don't get that in older meetings. So there's people sitting around with basically untreated alcoholism. And eventually, your energy and your attention to the fellowship ends up, you drift away. You drift away, and the next thing you know, you're drinking. And to get back in is sometimes very difficult and sometimes impossible. And so we lose a lot of people every year because they never got into the program. We don't insist that they get into the program. You know, before the meeting, a couple of the older older folks in here, the people that have been around longest, were saying, back in those days when I came in, everybody was tough. And now it's not so tough. They used to call us pigeons when we came in. Well, if you call a guy a pigeon today, he's liable to punch you in the face. They get offended by being called a, a pigeon. And people are like living their life in an eggshell, you know, and they don't want their eggshell cracked. And so you got to be gentle. My first sponsors were never gentle to me. Trust me. They beat me to death. They ragged me. They, I mean, I couldn't walk out of my house. Unfortunately, I picked a sponsor who lived right across the way from me. I had a door that had a squeaky hinge. So I'd open the door and it would squeak. And immediately my sponsor's door would swing open. He goes, where the hell are you going? Why are you going there? And I had to have a good place to go and I had to have a good reason for going there. Or he said, well, look, don't go there. Get back in the house. Read your, read your fourth step. You know, I had to get back into the house and do something. I, he wouldn't let me go anywhere. One day I'm riding down the street in my car and I, you know, I was a mean guy back then. And I ran through a puddle and splashed all the people at the bus stop because I had been riding the bus for a while. That's what everybody did to me. And I just did it. It was a dumb thing to do. But beep, beep, beep. My sponsor was behind me. He pulled me over like a cop. He pulled me over to the side of the road and read me out in the middle of the street because I did something stupid and inconsiderate and not kind to other people. He couldn't get away with anything back then. Nowadays, people would have a heart attack if their sponsor did that stuff. So it's a lot tougher back then. We had to get into the book. There was no choice. I was handed a book on the very first meeting I went to, and they wanted me to read Doctor's Opinion and Bill's story. 
before I went to the meeting on day two. There was no hesitating. I was given homework on day one. I couldn't even see straight. I was so hungover. But I had homework to do. I had to read the book with one eye closed. It was really hard. So today we're a little softer and we shouldn't be. Let's talk about moderate drinkers for a little bit. Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have a good reason for it. They can take it or leave it alone. Then we have a certain type of hard drinker. He may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally, but it may cause him and it may cause him to die a few years before his time. If a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or a warning from a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult or troublesome and may even need medical attention. So there are drinkers out there that are moderate drinkers or even heavy drinkers. People that drink like us. But they don't have the allergy. We talked about the allergy in doctor's opinion. So they can drink every day and get as drunk as they want to. But if their wife tells them to quit drinking, they can. If their boss warns them, one more time, you come in here with a hangover, you're fired. They can quit. They don't have the allergy. They don't have the obsession. They can quit. They're not alcoholics if you can quit. They don't have that allergy. So it doesn't matter. That's why you can't look at a guy and say, yep, that guy's an alcoholic. He could be stumbling drunk and not be an alcoholic. Only people that are alcoholics are people with the allergy. And they have the obsession of the mind. They take that first drink. It sets off the allergy. And then they can't control drinking. And they drink to oblivion. And they cannot stop knowing how bad it is for them to drink. The next time they see a drink, they'll pick it up and drink it, knowing full well it's going to be ruinous. So we'll read one more paragraph here. I'm going a little long tonight, but it's important. Now, this is about the real alcoholic. He says, well, what about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. He may or may not become a continuous hard drinker, but at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts drinking. So that's the difference between a moderate drinker or a heavy drinker and a real alcoholic. Here is a fellow who has been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. He does absurd, incredible, tragic things when he's drinking. He is a real Dr. Heckle and Mr. Hyde. He is seldom mildly intoxicated. Okay. As I read this chapter, this paragraph, and this is, by the way, the longest paragraph in the big book. Little trivia. Longest paragraph in a big book. And it's the longest paragraph because it's describing us thoroughly. So if you were one of these guys that I'm going to read about, please raise your hand. So it says, he's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. He is seldom mildly intoxicated. He is always more or less insanely drunk. Is that anybody? Yeah, that's a lot of us. His disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. He may be one of the finest fellows in the world, yet let him drink for a day, and he frequently becomes disgustingly and dangerously antisocial. That was me. He has a positive genius for getting tight at exactly the wrong moment, particularly when some important decision must be made or an engagement kept. Who's drank at just the absolutely worst time? Done it a million times. He is often perfectly sensible and well-balanced concerning everything except liquor. 
But in that respect, he is incredibly dishonest and selfish. He often possesses special abilities, skills, and aptitudes, and has a promising career ahead for him. He uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself, and then pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series of sprees. Sound familiar to anybody? Yep. He is a fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated he ought to sleep the clock around. Yet early next morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over his house to, to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pipe. Any bottle hiders here? Worst thing for me was I had booze all over my house. And then one day I just realized I live alone. Who am I hiding it from? So pretty awful. So then uh, as matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. Anybody needed to hair the dog? I used to have the hair of the dog every day. Then comes the day he simply cannot make it and he gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or some sedative with which to taper off. Then he begins to appear at hospitals and treatment centers. I mean, sanitariums. Yeah, every one of us knows all those things. And it says, this is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as our behavior patterns vary. But this description would identify him roughly. Now, we'll start again next week at that point, And it'll be a very interesting study to go through with some of the things that we learn about alcoholism more. And then we'll get into where is the solution. So thank you all for listening. I'll see you next week.